Does God exist? Is there really a God who created the entire universe and our own planet? Can I know that such a God exists? Can I live a life of certainty with respect to the existence of a supreme being? These are questions that we plan to explore on our program today. Till the good news was written and the full truth revealed That the church might be whole and Christ's fullness made real Our Lord in His wisdom gave men gifts from above The Spirit then taught them the truth in love How precious is the food divine by inspiration here Welcome. The world in which we live is filled with a variety of belief systems and viewpoints. Some people, for example the atheist and the humanist, are convinced that no supreme being exists and that this universe is all there is to reality. Others, like for example the Hindus, believe in many gods. Still others, like the Buddhists, believe that every creature, from the ant to the human, possesses divinity. All of these belief systems share in common the fact that they reject the idea of a supreme being who is transcendent from the universe, an all-powerful, all-knowing spirit being who is eternally self-existent, who created the material universe out of nothing by speaking it into existence in six literal days, who created the first human man and woman from whom all other human beings have descended. American culture itself is gradually increasing its resistance to such fundamental concepts, despite the fact that this country was founded upon these views. The Declaration of Independence, for example, openly speaks of the God of the Bible in such phrases as nature's God. It speaks of men who are endowed by their Creator. And it speaks of appealing to the supreme judge of the world and with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. The Constitution forbids the government from prohibiting the free exercise of religion, which to our founding fathers was the religion of the Bible. It was the God of the Bible that they believed in and sought to please. We are certainly facing perilous times in our history as a nation. We need to reinvestigate the principles and the premises upon which our nation was founded, lest we bring about the dissolution of our nation by forsaking the key to our survival. How many of our citizenry honestly subscribe to the words of the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God? How many Americans still really believe in the God of the Bible, as the song says, the God of our fathers? I invite you to turn with me for a few minutes to consider some of the evidence, the proof, for the existence of God. The existence of God can be decisively proven on the basis of the existence of the universe. You see, the universe is here, and it had to come from somewhere. The universe has not always been here. It is not eternal. The laws of thermodynamics prove that the universe is running down and thus had to have a beginning. 
Theories like the Big Bang are unreasonable. They do not adequately account for the existence of the universe. Such theories simply speak of matter being expanded into other forms. But matter had to have been created initially ex nihilo, that means out of nothing, by some superior, eternal, omnipotent force. There had to have been an uncaused first cause, an unmoved mover. The existence of the universe is proof positive of the existence of a universe maker. The Bible very simply and confidently affirms in its opening remarks, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The story is told that when the famous American statesman Benjamin Franklin was U.S. ambassador to France, living in Paris, he became a member of an elite literary, social, and scientific club. During one of their sessions, atheistic sentiments were expressed to the effect that only the superstitious and ignorant still believed in the God as, as the creator of the universe. Well, at the very next meeting, Franklin brought in a beautifully designed, meticulously executed model of the sun and our entire solar system. Each planet was properly proportioned and positioned in relation to the sun and all of the other planets. It was a masterpiece. He brought that in and one of the sophisticated intellectuals asked, who made it? With no trace of a smile, Franklin responded, no one, it just happened. Another proof for God's existence is seen not only in the fact that the universe exists, but also in the fact that the universe exhibits design, order, and purpose. The psalmist recognized this logical observation when he said, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork, Psalm 19, verse 1. He was pointing out the fact that the characteristics of design in the universe demonstrate the existence of a designer. The Hebrew writer did the same thing in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Folks, if houses cannot just happen or evolve over millions of years, how could worlds? If a watch cannot occur by chance, neither can the systematic chronometers of the universe. Their geometric precision is so superior to human invention that eclipses, planetary movements, other astronomical phenomena can be predicted literally centuries in advance. The universe is literally a fine-tuned, organized machine. No wonder the psalmist wrote, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? Psalm 8, verses 1 through 4. If we readily recognize that intelligent planning is behind all ordered design, how could nature's intricate networks have no planner? to observe the fantastic design in nature and then conclude there is no supreme designer is to behave irrationally. The evidence that surrounds us in the material universe demands the conclusion that God exists. The Apostle Paul declared, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. We simply have no excuse for rejecting God when we are surrounded by such an overwhelming display of wonders and marvels in the created order. Ask yourself, do cars just happen? Of course not. A mind lies behind the car, and yet compared to the universe, or compared to the human body, or even compared to the inner workings of one tree leaf. A car is a crude and primitive mechanism. 
If the creation of a car demands the existence of the remarkable human mind, what must be required for the creation of the human mind? Obviously, something or someone far superior to the human mind would be needed for its creation. That someone is the powerful, transcendent God of the Bible. The psalmist also stated, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Psalm 139, verse 14. Indeed, the human body itself is sufficient proof of the existence of the divine Creator. Right now, your body is, pre is performing amazing feats of engineering, chemistry, and physics that no machine designed by man can duplicate. Great human minds have applied themselves to the task of duplicating the various capabilities of the human body. Some incredible things have been accomplished in their efforts to copy God's creation, but they simply cannot compare with the marvel of God's design. For example, the development of the camera was based upon the human eye. Yet for all we have accomplished with video and sophisticated photographic equipment, the living, full-color optical system of the human eye is unsurpassed. Did you know you possess a self-restoring, self-repairing healing system? You have a sensitive stereophonic auditory system? You have tireless muscular connecting tissue systems? You have a well-engineered skeletal framework? You have a computerized memory bank brain. You have a ventilation insulation skin envelope, which constitutes an effective and efficient cooling system of 2,000 pores per square inch of skin. We cannot even begin to convey the massive amount of evidence available to us. The evidence for the marvelous, creative handiwork of God is simply staggering. So your own body is proof of God. Atheism cannot explain it. Evolution cannot logically account for it. Scientists have yet to fully understand it. The only plausible, rational explanation for the existence of human beings on this planet is God. Another proof of the existence of God is the fact that objective moral value exists. You see, if God does not exist, then all moral value, all ethics, all right and wrong are purely subjective. That means morality is merely the product of human beings arbitrarily deciding what is right and wrong. In the words of the French existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, if there is no God, everything is permitted. A group of human beings may very well come together and decide for themselves what standard of morality is going to govern them. But they would have to admit that such a standard would be wholly subjective and not binding upon anyone else. One society may outlaw murder, while another society may legalize murder, and no one could be critical of either society since no higher power exists by which either standard may be objectively assessed. This is precisely what happened during World War II. When the Nazi genocide was finally brought to an end and surviving Nazi leaders were brought to trial at Nuremberg, their defense centered on the fact that the rest of the world had no right to sit in judgment on their behavior. After all, they were merely obeying German law. When the Nazis tortured, tormented, and exterminated six million Jewish men, women, and children, they were simply complying with the laws of the land. They argued that the Allies had no more right to judge Nazis on the basis of American, British, or Russian law than the Nazis would have had the right to judge American citizens or British citizens according to German law. In fact, Heinrich Himmler specifically insisted to the court that the Nazis had the moral right and duty to destroy the Jews. If no God exists, the Nazis were right. We may not agree with their views and behaviors. We may not like them, 
We may not choose to go along with them, but we have no objective basis or legitimate platform upon which to stand and declare their views to be wrong. They could not even uh, be judged objectively guilty on the basis of international law for two reasons. One, no such thing as international law exists. Even the United Nations does not represent all nations on earth and you can't get them to agree. And secondly, even if you could assemble a bona fide official international governing body, what right would they have to determine right from wrong for everybody else? Their moral distinctions would still be purely subjective and their successors could just as easily reverse all of the laws and regulations that went before. In the case of the Nazis, a future body of lawmakers could declare the Nazis innocent and moral. And that determination would be just as correct as the previous decision to condemn the Nazis. Then upon what basis could the Nazis be legitimately judged to be guilty of moral wrong? Well, in his closing address at the Nuremberg trials, Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson, who served as the prosecutor at the trials, made the following statement that brings the matter into sharp focus. He said, these men should be tried on this basis, on a higher law, a higher law which rises above the provincial and the transient. Notice that he was saying that a higher law exists that governs all geographical areas and all periods of history. That law can only be God's law. He is the only one who transcends all times and all places. He is the only one who has a right to legislate moral value for everybody. But if there is no God, if we are all merely the result of evolution, the mechanistic chance forces of nature, then human life is ultimately of no more value than animal life. A cow is just as valuable as a person. You could place on a table a rock, a cockroach, a rat, and a human baby, and then go down that row of items, smashing each one with a sledgehammer. If God does not exist, there would be no ultimate difference, no ultimate significance to your actions. Such activity would all come down to personal preference and individual taste, mere human subjectivity. But the Bible teaches that not only did God create the human race, He also gave to us a moral standard by which we are to live. Humans are thus in a position to know absolute truth, objective right and wrong. If we will order our lives according to that divine standard, our society will experience well-being, harmony, and order. If, on the other hand, we choose to reject God's moral framework, make up our own standards, promote flexibility in regard to right and wrong, then chaos and crime will escalate and ultimately destroy society, which is exactly what we are experiencing in American culture. It's interesting to me that you will notice that all of those in our country who are working feverishly to overthrow the religious and moral fabric of American civilization they still want to live here. They do not want to go and live in countries and cultures around the world that believe in many gods or no gods. They don't want to live in a society where crime is rampant and law and order do not prevail. And yet they are doing everything they can with their atheistic, humanistic philosophy and liberal values to destroy the very framework and foundation that has made our nation largely free from these destructive conditions. This point about moral value brings us to a fourth proof for the existence of God, the conscience. There exists within every human being a moral sensibility, a capacity for moral distinctions. We call this capacity within us the conscience. The conscience is an inner sense or mechanism that urges us to act in harmony with our own belief system. The conscience does not provide us with the content of our belief system. Our values and beliefs come from 
external sources like parents, school, church, reading, etc. Moral values, beliefs about right and wrong, are taught, they are learned. But we all possess within us a conscience, a sense of oughtness. If I think a certain behavior is wrong, and I go ahead and engage in that behavior, there's a part of me that will feel guilty and thereby call attention to the fact that I went against what I believed. Notice that even though human beings have conflicting beliefs about what is right and wrong, we all possess this innate quality that undergirds our value system. C.S. Lewis illustrated this concept by describing a situation in which an individual is standing on a riverbank and he notices someone being washed down the river about to drown. Two impulses immediately register themselves in that bystander. One, dive in and save the person from drowning. Or two, avoid risking one's own life. But then a third impulse operates within us. A sense of oughtness that tells us that we ought to follow the impulse to help and suppress the impulse to avoid danger and run away. That third impulse that stands in judgment on the other two impulses is the conscience. My friends, the conscience is proof of God. Evolution can't account for it. A conscience could not evolve from rocks and dirt, dead matter. A conscience is a spiritual quality that was created and placed within us by the Creator. Read Acts 23, verse 1, 1 Timothy 4, 2, and a host of other passages. We have only just begun to examine the mountains of evidence that proves the existence of the God of the Bible. We've given four evidences that prove the existence of God. Let's list those for you one more time. The existence of the universe. The fact that there is design and order in the universe. Purpose. The existence of objective moral value. And finally, the existence of the human conscience. I hope to continue this line of thought in another program, and so I encourage you to tune in for our next program. In the meantime, I urge you to give careful consideration to these matters. You know, if there is no God, you are free to think, believe, do anything you wish, and ultimately none of it will matter. But if there is a God, how you conduct yourself matters very much. The Bible teaches that Almighty God has communicated to us through His Word. And we must comply with that will if we expect to spend eternity with Him when this life is over. To be pleasing to Him, one must believe in Him and His Son, repent of sin, confess Christ as Lord, and be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of sin. Read Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. If we may assist you in learning the Bible, please do not hesitate to write us. We will assist you with study materials, Bible correspondence courses that you can work through in the privacy of your own home. Please take the time to give consideration to these matters. Your eternal destiny is at stake. Psalm 14 verse 1 declares, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. I plead with you, don't be foolish. Examine the evidence for yourself. Search for the truth. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I'll be back in just a moment.
Pause and pray with me, if you would, please. Our Holy Father, we're grateful to you, not only for life itself, but for all of the blessings you give us, and for the fact that you've left witness of yourself in the created order, that we might know that you exist, and that we might learn what to do to live in such a way that we can be pleasing to you. We pray that you will help all of us to do that. Through Jesus we pray, amen. I hope that you have found uh, benefit from this program. <clears throat> if you'll tune into our program next time, we will continue some thoughts along this line. In the meantime, if you would like to write us this coming week, we're going to make the material available that uh, we presented on the program today. We have this available in the form of our usual free audio cassette tape. But in this case, we also have a written transcript and we would be happy to make either one of these available to you. All you have to do is write us at The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas, 76053. Request the free audio cassette tape or the written transcript, and our volunteer workers will get that out to you just as quickly as they can. Again, we're grateful that you've tuned in, and we hope this material encourages you. May you study God's Word. God bless. Now the full revelation has been given to man. Let us strive for the kingdom by God's clear plan. We must never be swayed by the doctrines of men. Speak the truth in love and grow up. Speaking the truth, speaking the truth, speaking the truth, speaking the truth. Speaking the truth. Speaking the truth.